All right, HVAC Control Pro, how many times have you been in the situation where you go to troubleshoot a job because people are hot and the equipment's not working and the BAS guys are going, hey, it's not us, it's you. Bad spot to be in. Okay, in this video, we're going to show you how to use data as a way to troubleshoot what's going on. As a teacher man once said, in God we trust and all else get data. So we're going to take you live to a StromQuest training class where our friend Tim Shambly explains how he uses data and explains a real life situation in which people were getting pretty angry. So definitely check the video out, go to the end. If you like it, please give us a thumbs up, please subscribe to the channel. And hey, if you have any comments, we'd love to hear from you. All right, what I'm saying is if you can take this measurement and it's not hard, and if you take this formula uh, the inches of water column, multiply it by about 4,000, and then multiply it by the effective area of the duct, square length times width, or round pi r square. You know, you, you've got your area formulas. You plug and chug it, and all of a sudden, from a pitot tube probe, <laughs> it can give you your feet per minute, or if you actually multiply it by the area, your CFM. So now you can take a tool and measure and know, and know how much air is going through that duct. You could go to a VAV box that has um, your, your uh, high and low tubes coming out of it and you could measure it there and know how much air is going through that box. Call Joe up at the computer and say, hey, what's the computer saying is my airflow? You can measure it right there and verify rather than just assume that everything is right. Measurement is, is, is really important and then verification. Well, you Phoenix valves, mm -hmm. checking all those. Trying to get all that yeah. balanced out right. Yeah, a absolutely. I mean, that's a task in itself. Yes. Now, more formulas. Uh, if you, uh, I, I, I like formulas. I, I say, make math your friend, you'll be able to do your job better. All right. One important aspect of building is proper outside air. We've got to have the right ventilation air. Okay? Uh, and, and we can actually measure that. You can figure your percent outside air. If you take your return air and uh, the difference between return and your mixed air, you want to do this before the coil, um, and then uh, divide that by the difference between your outside air and your uh, return air. Hit it with a, a hundred to turn it into a percent. That'll give you your percent of outside air provided there's good thermal distance between outside air and your mixed air and return air. You've got, you have to have good differentials. If your return air is 75 degrees and your outside air is 76 degrees, the math doesn't work. Okay, But you can take this same formula and let's say if you have a CO2 handheld sensor, you can look at your return air CO2, the difference between that and your mixed air CO2. Now temperature doesn't matter. So the, the math works just the same. So this is where, because if you bring in too little outside air, problems occur. If you bring in too much outside air, problems occur. You need the correct amount. Your building is designed for a certain amount. And things happen in the lifespan of this mechanical equipment. Dampers start wearing, knuckles start seizing up, sort of like us. <laughs> um, so we can relate. 
Don't expect your building to be working perfectly. It is not. And just the fact that we've got 55 degree discharge air, that's not good enough anymore. We've got to verify, we've got to measure, we've got to monitor, we've got to trend and track this stuff. And it will tell you. I had a situation where um, I, I worked for a, a, a chiller service company and there was a, uh, a college, a local college had a McQuay machine and um, it, it was just doing some weird stuff, tripping off, you know, McQuay looked at it, they couldn't figure out what was going on, uh, you know, so my chiller mechanics looked at it, they couldn't figure it out, they just know they had this mysterious, it would trip off, uh, you know, every day, nobody could figure it out. So I decided, okay, I'm going to figure it out myself, and I, I'm not smart enough to do this, I have to rely on instruments. Back then I had um, some data recorders that had, uh, you know, they were four channel recorders and so I was looking at uh, temperature in and out everywhere there was an in and out on that machine. <laughs> I was looking at amps, I, I, everything. So I had a good bird's eye view of the operation of that chiller. Now bear in mind, chiller mechanics, good mechanics, look at everything's perfect. Cannot figure out why this thing was tripping out. Well, as I was recording this, taking a sample every minute, or every 30 seconds, whatever it was, um, downloaded the data, printed it out, and the answer reached its hand off that paper and slapped me in the face and said, here I am. It's not that I'm so smart, I knew more about it than some of these other chiller guys, but it was just, I was seeing that, well, at midnight, my temperatures did some weird, weird stuff. And what it was obvious, uh, my air handlers were cutting off because my, my water temperatures just dove at midnight every night. So I took it to the uh, maintenance, the in charge of maintenance for the college and said, here's your problem. And he goes to the people that did the automation. They said, well, we've checked our sequences. It ain't us. All right, okay, so a classic mechanic saying automation, automation saying mechanic, you know, pointing, okay. And so uh, I just bowed up and <laughs> I said, let me tell you something. Paper don't lie. It's right here. And so they took a deeper look and noticed that the global command was correct. And what they were seeing at the front end was correct. But at the local controllers, somehow they were ignoring that global command and they were commanding the fans off at midnight uh, throughout the building. Of course the thing was tripping out and, the, and nobody could figure out how it got there, you know, where uh, it, all of a sudden the local controllers were ignoring the global command. Well, two, two things, McQuay has enough. Uh, uh, that that uh, I, I don't disagree with that. However, this was an older machine. In in fact, it was an uh, R12 machine. This, this, so it didn't have the, the yeah didn't this did not have the panel that you go up and, and it had the old style panel. Although it did have some electronics, it was early electronics. So, I guess they don't have um, either. Um, and, and back back in that time, trends consumed a lot of memory and, and, and it bogged down our systems. So that's a classic example of you know being able to monitor and measure and meter, you know, all this I'm I'm talking about 
it, you know, I'm trying to, to bring it to life. It's more than just throwing some uh, th slides on the screen and say, hey, you know, see this hickey jig, it does a good job. No. I want you to know that this stuff is real. And if you, if you are not using this stuff, you're missing out on an opportunity to do your job better. Okay, that's it. Thanks, Tim. If you are interested at all in getting any of the instruments or data loggers that Tim Chamway and other control pros use, you can go to Stromquist.com. We're, we're a master distributor of HVAC and smart building controls. We keep over $3 million of inventory between our Atlanta and Orlando warehouse. We'd love to take care of you. So if you're a first-time customer, go to Stromquist.com. Enter the code on your first order. CT for Control Trends 10 and get 10% off on your first order. All right, we'll see you next time.